right, good evening, everybody. Happy spring break to all. Uh, to all who happen to be on spring break, that is. <laughs> uh, I am on spring break, so. Uh, if you guys could do me a favor and open your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 5. Gospel of John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 39. And uh, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer for the evening. Father, we, Lord, just worship you and praise your name because you are worthy to receive our worship, our honor, and our praise. And we just thank you so much for the many blessed, great, and wonderful gifts, mundane and sacred that you pour out in our lives, Lord. We know your word tells us that every good and perfect gift is poured out from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shifting shadow, no turning. And so, Father, we just recognize that you are reliable, that we can trust in you, we can rest in you. And we know, God, that you hold us in the palm of your hand, and no man plucks us out. We just pray as we open your word this evening, Father, that you would instruct us in it, that you would teach us from it, and that through it, Father, our hearts would be changed and we would be conformed into the image of Christ. Bless this time, bless this evening, bless those who hear the word, and uh, be glorified through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to start off here with a passage in John, not a passage in Genesis, a uh, passage in John uh, in which... Uh, Jesus is in a discussion with some of the religious leaders of the Jews, some of the rabbis, and uh, has a conversation with them, and he makes a very interesting point in verse 39. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now, I, I want to kind of start off by just pointing out that, that he's speaking to the Jewish community. And in truth, the way he describes their relationship with the scriptures uh, is very much the way that the Jewish community's relationship with the scriptures holds even today. For Jews really do search the scriptures because in them they think they have eternal life. Uh, they really do believe that salvation comes through the Torah. Uh, and, and that's actually something that's helpful for you to understand when you're reading the scriptures, especially if you're reading Paul the Apostle. When Paul talks about people being saved by grace as opposed to people being saved by the law, he has in his mind the fact that his people, the Jewish people, they believe salvation, relationship with God, forgiveness of sin, the, the uh, connection with God and the hope of heaven comes through the law, which of course in Hebrew is the Torah, referencing the first five books of the Bible. To this day, a Jewish, an Orthodox Jewish person, a person who is faithful to the Torah, to the law, would... Um, uh, if, if, a, if, a, if a friend or loved one passed away or if somebody, if they were in a conversation and, and it came up that somebody had passed away, they would say something, they would ask a question, something like this. Did he accept the Torah, right? Kind of like we might ask, having heard that somebody passed away, whether or not that person had accepted Jesus. Because to a Jew, salvation is through the law through the Torah. So when Jesus sits here talking to these Jewish leaders and says, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, he is pointing out the fact that they really do factually believe that salvation comes through the law, through the Torah, through the scriptures. That's where life is to be found. Now, I will point out, he doesn't contradict them. He doesn't say, you're wrong, salvation doesn't come through the scriptures. What does he say? He says, and these are they which testify of me. In other words, they, eternal life, salvation, reconciliation with God, new life, it is found in the scriptures. 
Why? Because the scriptures are what testify about Jesus. Now, uh, so, so just first thing to keep in mind, this conversation he has in that quote, these, the scriptures are they which testify of me. Second thing, if you would, turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. And locate verse 25. Um. This recounts uh, an episode in the life of Jesus after he resurrected from the dead when he encounters a couple of disciples who were wandering on the road to Emmaus who, of course, are not aware that Jesus has resurrected. And Jesus walks for a bit with them and they do not recognize him. For whatever reason, the scriptures are not super clear exactly what happens, but some kind of a supernatural implication is is there that these, that, that they like Jesus is veiled from them. They can't tell who he is. So after having spent some time with them and after they talked to him, uh, uh, look at verse 25, Uh, you know, in the midst of the conversation as they say, don't you know what happened to Jesus? He says, oh foolish one, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, they were lamenting the fact that Jesus had died. They were lamenting the fact that their vision of the Messiah coming and setting them free was not being fulfilled. And Jesus says, don't you understand? After all that time with me, did you not understand the scriptures? And verse 27, it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Now, now I want to pause. When it says beginning at Moses, what it means is beginning there in the book of Genesis. Because when he talks about Moses, he's talking about the first five books, the Torah, the law, which were written by Moses. Beginning at Moses and then going through all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So what does he do with them? He begins to open the Bible and to talk to them about himself uh, and, and, and pointing out where in the Old Testament, all the way back in Genesis and carrying all the way through just how the scriptures repeatedly are pointing to him and talking about him. Okay, now with that in mind, let's go back to Genesis 14 where I left you off, left off with you last week. I have two things I hope to accomplish today in our discussion. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through both of them. I'm going to try to gauge the clock. If I get through the first and I think there's enough time for the second, I might not leave us a Q&A bit. So, so just be aware that that could be up in the air. Uh, but I wanted to take a look here in chapter 14, uh, kind of picking up where we left off in last week's study. If you recall in last week's study, um, Of course, Abraham and Lot had a, there was conflict between the two of them and between their servants over where, you know, basically over the resources of the land. So Abraham told Lot, hey, feel free, take whichever side you want. Lot Lot chose to go um, to Sodom and to live amongst the people of Sodom and amongst the people of Gomorrah, chose to live with the people of the plain and things didn't turn out well for him because of course, armies from Mesopotamia came in, ended up capturing the city of Sodom and taking the people uh, and enslaving them, essentially. Well, trying to take them back to Mesopotamia. But Abram goes and saves them with 317 armed servants. They go and they rescue them. And afterwards, if you recall, the king of Sodom goes to Abram and says, thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving my people. Feel free to take everything that you, whatever you want. And Abram says, of course, no, I'm not going to take anything. Uh, that you offered me because I never want anybody to say that you made me rich, that you made me wealthy. But in the midst of this, this weird thing happens. This weird thing that I want to look at right now, which I glossed over last week and is of great interest and importance. Verse 18, in the midst of that whole narrative I ran down with you yesterday, this very interesting story pops up. Verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, Mind you, really quickly, Melchizedek, king of Salem, was not mentioned in any of the kings of the previous chapter. So when it talked about the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and their allies, and when it talked about the kings of Mesopotamia, it did not mention this guy Melchizedek, nor did it mention Salem, whatever Salem is. 
which we're not 100% certain. We have some ideas, there are theories, but we're not 100% certain about what Salem is. There was no mention of this guy. He just pops up out of nowhere after Abraham, uh, you know, gains this victory. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. So he brings bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. He was the priest of God most high. I want to pause here for a second. Keep in mind as we read this stuff that, of course, the peoples of antiquity were, uh, um, I almost said polygamists, which they were. Uh, they were most of them, uh, or I should say the wealthy, polytheists. They were polytheists. That is, most of them worshipped many gods. And, of course, um, most of them worshipped gods that they essentially associated with nature. And of course, in their understanding of these gods, there was a hierarchy and a ranking system and all of that kind of stuff. And in the midst of, of this, this one guy comes out and says, well, I'm the priest of the highest God. I am the priest of God most high. And, and who has delivered your enemies, that is Abram's enemies, into his hand. And then notice this, speaking of Abram, it says, and he, that is Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. End of story. That's it. It just cuts off. If you remember last week, I actually skipped that and picked up in verse 21, where it says, now the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, take the goods for yourself. It automatically goes back to Abram talking to the king of Sodom about basically what he was going to get in light of his recent victory. End of story. Melchizedek comes out, bread and wine, presumably to share with Abram. All we learn about him is that he is Melchizedek. He is uh, king of Salem and he is priest of God most high. And we read that Abram gives him a tithe, which of course a tithe means a 10th. So a 10th of all. Now it's a little unclear what a 10th in this context is going to be. Uh, is that a 10th of all the spoils that were available? If you remember, uh, Abram in a little bit is going to tell the king of Sodom that he will not uh, take any riches from the king, uh, but will instead just take the food that was given, uh, you know, or the food that was necessary for his men to eat. Um, and so was it a tenth of that? We don't know exactly what the tenth is of, but he gives a tenth of all to, uh, to this guy, Melchizedek. Okay, so having said all that, Let's go ahead and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter one. Book of Hebrews chapter one, because you could kind of take it or leave it. And I actually wrestled with or contemplated, thought about leaving it um, because I wanted to get into chapter 15 because I love chapter 15 so much. There is one other place in the Old Testament that references this guy, Melchizedek. You can jot this down. It's Psalm 110 verse four. Psalm 110 verse four this is in one of the Psalms, uh, a psalm, you know, one in which that David wrote. And in it, David, speaking of, it's not entirely clear, the king of Israel, which would be himself, his son, the Messiah. He says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I, I want to set a little bit of background here before we start reading into Hebrews. Because we have to kind of move forward through time. Right? We're reading about Abram right now. And you have to remember, in the days of Abram, in his time, there is no such thing as Israel. There are no such thing as Jews, no Jewish people. Abram is the forefather of the Jews. The Jewish people will descend from Abram's grandson, Jacob, who will also be called Israel. And that's, of course, where the nation of Israel comes from. The nation of Israel are the descendants of Jacob. So in Abram's day, there is just Abram. But you guys know his story. He's going to have a son, Isaac. He's going to have a couple of, few, a couple of sons, few sons, actually. Uh, but he's going to have a son, Isaac. And his son, Isaac, will have twins, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob will ultimately have 12 sons and a daughter. And of these 12, or and these 12 sons will themselves, will themselves multiply into a nation. So over the course of 400 years, while they're actually serving as slaves in Egypt, they will grow to uh, exceed over a million people. And that's when they become a nation of people while they're in Egypt enslaved. Um, when they come out of Egypt and come into the land that God promises to them, 
Um, God is going to set up a whole bunch of rules about how they're supposed to run their country, about how they're supposed to live in that particular land. And one of the things that God is going to do is he is going to appoint, appoint a priestly caste for the children of Israel. That is an entire class of people who are going to be priests in Israel. And these people are going to be the kinsmen of Israel's leader, Moses. They're going to be the people of the tribe of Levi, which is the tribe which Moses would have been descended from. So Levi would be the son of Jacob, which would make him Abram's great-grandson. And here's the key thing you need to note. In Israel, you are not a priest unless you're a son of Levi. Okay, you have no opportunity to be a priest unless you're a descendant of Levi. And actually, it gets even more specific because the Levites minister in the tabernacle of God or late, subsequently in the temple of God. But actually, you have to be descended from Aaron himself, that is Moses' brother, who is also of the tribe of Levi, to actually be a priest. That's important because, of course, the kings of Israel, following David, will be descended from David who is of the tribe of Judah. And so here's the thing you need to make a mental note of. The kings of Israel are not to be priests. They are not meant to be priests because the tribe of Levi gives us the priests and the tribe of Judah gives us the kings and never the twain shall meet, or at least it ought not be so. And so it's interesting when David makes this comment in Psalms and he says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, seeming to speak of one of his descendants. Seeming to speak of somebody who comes from his line. And it will be these two verses coupled with a whole bunch of thought and thinking from the first century Jewish community, from the rabbis and different writings out there, that the author of Hebrews is going to kind of draw from as he gives a pretty interesting teaching on who this guy Melchizedek is. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Now I want to pause here. We learn a little bit about this Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek, we find out what it means. Melchizedek is translated as king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. But he's also described as the king of Salem. Now, I said uh, a little earlier that we don't know what Salem is exactly. Uh, most people identify it with the city of Jerusalem, but the city of Jerusalem, of course, as we think of it, isn't going to really be built until the time of David. Prior to that, it will be a city and it will be inhabited by a tribe of Canaanites known as the Jebusites. Um, but we're not certain if Salem is supposed to be associated with Jerusalem or not. But the word Salem means peace, right? You guys uh, probably, if you know any Hebrew word, it's the word shalom, right? So the word shalom is related to the word Salem. Salem means peace. So shalom means peace. King of righteousness, king of peace. It's the first thing that the author of Hebrews tells us about this man, Melchizedek. His name means king of righteousness, and he is known as the king of peace. And then he goes on and he says, more. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, why does he say without mother, without father? because of the way Melchizedek bursts onto the scene. There is no discussion of where he came from. There is no reference to his forefathers. He is just there in, in kind of, we're introduced to him. And so we're, we read nothing of his history. We read nothing of where he came from, without father, without mother. And then it says, but instead, like the son of God, he is a priest continually. A priest continually as opposed to the Levites who were not priests continually, because of course on the Levitical system, you would have a high priest and that high priest would serve during the duration of his life. And when he died, the priesthood would pass to another high priest. So there was of course a cycle. There wasn't a person who was to be a priest forever. 
Verse four, now consider how great this man was. So consider how great this man Melchizedek was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a 10th of the spoils. So he stops and he says, let's think about how impressive and important this individual is. Even Abraham paid him a tithe. Abraham, the patriarch, right? The father of faith, the granddaddy of us all. He gave a tithe to this man. How great must this man be? Verse five, and indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood, that's what I referenced earlier, right? The descendants of Levi are made priests, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So what's he saying there? He's saying the priests who descend from Aaron, who descend from Levi, they have a commandment in the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, to receive tithes from the, the people, right? Because of course the priestly caste, what, they didn't have regular jobs. They didn't have jobs to provide for themselves. They needed to be taken care of. And the way that the priestly caste was taken care of was by the offerings of the people. So the people had to pay a tithe and that tithe is what fed and clothed and sheltered the priests and the Levites. So he says, you have the Levites, they receive this tithe by commandment from the people of Israel, according to the law from their brethren. Verse six, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them, this is Melchizedek, his genealogy is not derived from the Levites, he is not derived from Israel or Isaac or Abraham. From, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them, he received tithes from Abraham and now blessed him who had the promises. So the interesting key point here is, Melchizedek blessed Abraham, verse seven. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Now I wanna pause here for a second because we tend to think of the word blessed as just, you know, a, a general feeling of happiness, right? I'm blessed if you've done something kind for me. But here he's talking about a blessing in the traditional sense of the term. And in the traditional, in the traditional sense of the term, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And what I mean by that is, is the person who holds a position of honor or the person who is older or the person who has a position of power and authority, they give the blessing to those who are under them. It doesn't work the other way around, okay? You can see this and we will see it when Esau and Jacob both go to their father uh, Isaac and ask for a blessing from him. He gives the fatherly blessing, which was supposed to be something that fathers did. A son doesn't bless the father, the father blesses the son, right? And so the key point here that the author of Hebrews is trying to drive at is Abraham, the great, great Abraham, whom we love, our father, whom we revere more than almost anyone, he is lesser than this Melchizedek. Without contradiction, the greater it blesses the lesser or the lesser is blessed by the greater. So Abraham is lesser. Verse eight, here mortal men receive tithes, that is of the house of Levi, but there he receives them, meaning immortal people, right? Because he's already said this about Melchizedek. He is made like the son of God. He remains a priest continually, made like the son of God. He remains a priest continually. There he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Verse nine, even Levi, who receives the tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So what's he saying there? He's saying, heck, it's kind of like Aaron through Levi, through uh, uh Isaac or Israel through Isaac through Abraham actually was paying tithes. So this whole priesthood that we have in this day and age is subservient and is secondary and is inferior to the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now, verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according 
to the order of Aaron. Now, to kind of explain what he's getting at here, I have to explain the overall point of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is in a very systematic way trying to point by point explain why Jesus as Lord, as Messiah is greater than every part of the priestly Levitical system that existed in Israel at that time, right? Your typical Jew, as I said before, in that day and age would have believed that salvation came through the Torah, came through the law. And that meant being obedient to the law. And when you failed in being obedient to the law, it meant keeping the sacrifices properly in the right ways, in the right places at the right times. And what is he saying here? What he's saying is, the priestly system, which you guys love and which you revere and which you look up to, it is insufficient. It is not perfect. If it could make you perfect, if it could actually cleanse you from your sins, he said, what need would there be for there to arise another priest according to the order of Melchizedek, not according to the order of Aaron? And here he's referencing that passage in Psalm 110 that I referenced earlier, where David said, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. Okay, so what he's saying there is he's saying, the man that we're speaking of is Jesus. And Jesus doesn't come from the tribe of Levi, and yet Jesus is a priest, and Jesus is our high priest, which is something he's already taught. And that brings confusion to these Jewish people who think, well, a high priest is supposed to come from Aaron. How can Jesus, who comes from David, who comes from Judah, be a high priest? And he says, ah, because the priesthood of Aaron is insufficient, so we need a new priest, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And yet it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. So, we have a priest who covers our iniquities once and for all. We have a priest who, when he forgives our sins, our sins remain forgiven. We have a priest who, when he died once and for all, he said, it is finished. Meaning there is no more work to be done for you or for me to attain righteousness or atonement or anything. We are perfected in that priest. Not perfected in the sense that we never sin, perfected in the sense that there is no more stain of sin on us. We are washed clean. And that is done by a priest who was not of the tribe of Aaron. And his whole point is, and shouldn't it be that way? Because the tribe of Aaron has been, or the tribe of Levi and the descendants of Aaron have been ministering uh, as priests for a very long time. And they keep offering the same sacrifices over and over and over again. And what happens? People continually need new sacrifices because they continue to need new forgiveness because their sins are never once and for all wiped away. And so he's saying that old system is insufficient. It needed to be replaced by a new and that is why, verse 17, he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment, an annulling meaning a getting rid of the former commandment, meaning getting rid of the former commandment to offer sacrifices in the temple with a Levitical priest because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect, in other words, the law is incapable of saving, which is what the people thought in that day. But on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And so, without spending too much more time on this, let's go ahead and go back to Genesis 14, 
what is the author of Hebrews ultimately saying? Well, the author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is king, rightfully so, because he's the descendant of David from the tribe of Judah, the one who was supposed to yield the Messiah, the one through whom the kingly line is supposed to come. And so he is our rightful king. But even more importantly, he is the true high priest, the true high priest who makes an offering, one offering that forgives our sins once and for all and which never needs to be replicated. And in doing so, it takes or it supplants or takes the place of the old offering, the offerings of bulls and sheep and the like, which had been offered for so many generations in Israel. And the great thing about it is we have a guy from one tribe who is both king and priest. Okay, now, why did I go through all of that? Well, I, I take you back to the verses I started with. I take you back to those, grounded to those disciples, all those principles about himself, right? The Bible speaks of Jesus. Um, and when he, in John chapter five, he's talking to the Jews and he says, you search your scriptures for you think in them you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. And so I'm trying to, Lord willing, look at this Old Testament, look at the scriptures, open it up and say, how does it testify of Jesus? And here is one of the ways that it testifies of him. Abram, who is great, who is our forefather, the forefather of faith, this guy who deserves our reverence and our respect. He is inferior to this mysterious man who shows up here in the midst of the narrative. This mysterious man who, what does he bring? Wine and bread. And what does presumably he do? He shares a meal with Abram. And what does he take? He takes tithe as worship, as an, as an expression of worship and offering. So many commentators, of course, and it seems like the author of Hebrews looking at this seems to look at this story of Melchizedek and sees in Melchizedek Jesus himself. And so although there are some disagreements and some people have some slightly different takes, all Christian teachers throughout history agree that Melchizedek is at least a type of Christ, a type meaning like a foreshadowing or a person who, who, whose life and experiences and deeds seem to echo or kind of point to those of Christ who is to come, or they think he is a Christophany, meaning he is an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, which it does seem like that's what the author of Hebrews is saying, that when Abram was sitting, had, had won there over those Mesopotamian kings, who should come out to worship with him? Who should come out and bring bread and wine, the very elements of communion, but Jesus himself. And so Jesus himself meets with Abram in this particular moment. Very interesting moment indeed. Having done that, I wanna shift gears now. We have one hour, so I wanna get into, um, and this is going to be a to be continued because chapter 15 begins this story, but of course it's going to carry on with some interludes in between. Chapter 17 will carry it on. So I'm gonna kinda of leave off and then touch on other things and then come back when we get to chapter 17. But um, remember where I ended last week. Remember where I ended last week. Abram was offered great wealth and riches from the king of Sodom. And Abram was already pretty wealthy. He was already fairly rich. Um, but he rejects that. He says, nope, I will not let it be said that the king of Sodom made Abram wealthy. So no, I'm not gonna take one thing that you offer me. Instead, I'll just take the food that, you're, that you have for my servants and then my allies, those who came and fought alongside of me, I'll allow them to take what they want, but that's it. And then with that in mind, pick up in chapter 15, verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, I want you to pause here. I want to be careful because I don't want to add anything to Scripture. I don't want to necessarily put my personal interpretation in it, but I'm going to do that because 
And, and just so you guys, actually a little side note. A little side note. I hope you guys all understand that anytime somebody is teaching the Bible, they are, in a certain sense, uh, bringing their disposition and their particular biases and their particular interpretive schemes to it, right? Because of this, you always have to try as best you can, and it's you can't be perfect with it, because you're human beings, which means you yourself have your interpretive schemes and your biases and your ignorances, just like I have my ignorances, your lack of information, just like I have my lack of information. And because of that, we sometimes can, or we'll read it and we'll add or we'll take away stuff without even realizing we're doing it, right? That's not in and of itself bad, but you have to always be aware of what is the word of God and what isn't the word of God, right? Of the actual words the Bible is saying versus the person who's interpreting and what he's kind of saying about it. You always have to be able to, to make that distinction. This is ultimately, in the book of Acts, we read uh, about Paul and uh, I think it was Barnabas, might've been Silas, but I think it was Barnabas, going to the people of Berea, and sharing the gospel with the people of Berea. And it says about these people that they were fair-minded and they searched the scriptures diligently to see whether or not the things that Paul and Barnabas were saying were true. And that's what we all should do. Having said that, anytime you read a commentary, anytime you hear a sermon, you are hearing, hopefully from the Holy Spirit, but also partly from the voice of the individual speaking, right? And... And just as an aside, I know some people, because they're keenly aware of this, will, will kind of denounce commentaries or say commentaries aren't useful. Just keep in mind, it happens every time you hear a sermon as well, right? Like commentary sermons, it's the same thing. It's people commenting on the scriptures. So having said that, I want to kind of bring into this my impression. Is this exactly right? I don't know. But when I read the words, I hear them a certain way and they strike me a certain way, and I think I'm right, otherwise I wouldn't say it, but I could be wrong. But what I hear when the Lord says to Abram, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward, what I hear him saying is, good job, good job. Man, I'm so proud of you. That's awesome what you just did. You went, you bravely saved these people, and then you rejected wealth at their hands because you trusted that I would take care of you. Good job. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So what's he saying? He's saying, God is saying to Abram, you turn down wealth, you turn down riches. That's good because I am your reward and you should do everything for me. Not, not in the sense of like, you know, do everything for me. What I mean is, is you should live your life always looking at your ultimate reward as being me and nothing else, right? As being me and nothing else. Good job. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Would you pause here and turn with me? I just decided I was gonna go somewhere that I hadn't planned. So, so bear with me here. Turn with me to Psalm 73, Probably my favorite passage of scripture. This is a Psalm of Asaph, who was one of the priests, Psalm of Asaph, who was a musician known for being a great musician. And this whole Psalm, Psalm 73, is a contemplation. It's a contemplation on suffering and on evil. And, and what Asaph is essentially doing is he's looking at how the wicked seem to prosper. And he's asking the question of how is it that God can allow wicked people to do well? How is it that he can let them succeed to let them be victorious in all things, but so often the righteous are left hungry? And he's really struggling with this to the point where he's doubting. He's actually questioning God's reality. And there comes a moment in the course of the psalm where all of a sudden he comes to his senses and he realizes that seeing wick, uh, wicked people prosper right now isn't the end of the story, that there's more to the story that is to come. 
And it is when he has this moment that he's like, he feels peace and joy. And he makes a confession of sin. And he says in verse 22, let's actually start in verse 22. I was so foolish and ignorant. In other words, I was so foolish for asking this question. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will everything. I don't understand everything. I know things go poorly. And I know sometimes I suffer and things go hard for me. But I know you're with me. And I know you guide me. And I know you hold my hand. And I know at the end of this, I'm going to be with you in glory. Now the key verse is verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Whom have I besides you, Lord? What do I have in this world except for you? And I think this gets at the heart of what God is saying to Abram in that moment when he says, I am your shield, I am your exceedingly great reward. And guys, I do have to say, if you can wrap your head around this truth, you will be happy. Don't get me wrong here. I am not a prosperity gospel person. I'm not one of those guys who's gonna say everything's gonna turn out well for you and you will have no suffering and no loss. That is never guaranteed to us. You will suffer. In fact, I guarantee it, you will suffer. The scriptures actually say those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You will suffer. But this is the secret to life. If you can learn to not love or want anything in this world, except for God himself, you will be happy because you will never lose him. If you can get in this headspace that Asaph is here, where you know that he is, nevertheless, you are always with me. Nevertheless, you always guide me. Nevertheless, you always hold me by your right hand. And if you can sit there and say, I have nothing in all of the earth or in all of heaven besides you, and to where I desire and long for nothing but you, then you will be happy because he will never leave nor forsake you and you can never lose him. And even in the midst of the worst kinds of loss and the worst kinds of pain and the worst kinds of suffering, you know he'll be there and you know that he will protect you through it. He may allow you to endure it, but he'll be with you through it. And that's what he's saying when he says to Abram, I am your shield, I'm your protector, I'm the one who guards you and I am your reward. Go back to, to Genesis 15. I love Abram's response. And again, I'm here giving my interpretive thing here. This is the tone in which I hear him say this. Verse two. I'm gonna add these words again, like I said, my interpretation. But Abram said, really, Lord? Really? What will you give me, seeing that I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. What do I take Abram to be saying here? God looks at him and says, good job. You turned away the riches. You didn't desire the worldly wealth and possession. Good job. I am your reward. And Abram says, really? Great. A lot of good that does me. And I like that because, guys, I just gave you the secret to life, I think. <laughs> Or one of the secrets, not the only one, but one of the secrets to a happy life is knowing how to love God only, and not only, but to love him in such a way to where he is the only thing you want and desire. And then we see Abram, the father of faith, who gets this better than anybody, and we find that he actually doesn't do a very good job of it. Which means we're destined to also love things in this world and want them and be disappointed when we don't get the things that we want. You know what I'm saying? And we too will be in, find ourselves in that position and in that place where we go, really, Lord, really? And, and I know many, I don't know about, I don't know, I, I, su I suspect we've all done this to some degree. I mean, I can't speak for everyone in this room, but I've certainly heard many people say it. Many people say, really, does God really love me? Because if he really loved me, would he have let X, Y, or Z? Or why hasn't he given me this? That's what Abram's doing right here. 
Abram is sitting there and saying, if you really loved me, if you really were my reward, if you really were my shield, if you really were taking care of me, you would give me the one thing. And if you guys remember, when we started looking at this life of Abram, I brought this up. The one thing he wants, the one thing, he wants a son. That's his thing. He can turn down wealth, he can turn down riches because wealth and riches are not the desire of his heart. They're not the thing he ultimately wants. A son that's the desire of his heart. And guys, I wish I could unfold all of this for you today, but I will not be able to. So you have to kind of lock this away in your mind. You have to remember this for down the road because this is going to be something that is going to keep popping up and is going to keep playing in the story of Abram. He wants a son above everything else. And so what does he say? He says, he says where is my son? Like, especially because you promised already. You've already told me I'd have one and the days just keep passing. I keep getting older and I keep not having one. And who's going to inherit all of my wealth? Who's gonna inherit all of my possessions? It's gonna be one born in my house. That's what it says, one born in my house. One born in my house is a phrase referring to his servant, Eliezer. So he has a servant and that person, his highest ranking servant, who is no doubt the guy who manages his household affairs, that guy is the one who stands to inherit all of Abram's possessions. Look at God's response to this, verse four. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir. And I like this. Then he brought him outside. Then he brought him outside. I don't know what that means, but what I picture is this. And this is the thing you always have to remember about Abram. And, and I want to like, I want you to be thinking back to the beginning of Genesis, right? Beginning of Genesis, we saw Adam, Eve in a garden, and it said that God walked in the coolness of the garden with them. And what was the punishment for Adam and Eve? Amongst other things, they were driven from the garden, and a sword was put up, a sword that would, so that they would not be able to go back in, right? One of the things that was taken from them is closeness to God, relationship with God. And what do we see here with Abram? He's hanging out in his tent with God. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't, I don't think that that's like God personally manifest in human form or something like that. But what I hear when it says he took him outside, I hear, I see pictured in my mind, God putting his arm around Abram and saying, come outside, let me show you something. Puts his arm around him, removes the flap of the tent, takes him outside. Keeping in mind as you read what's coming next, Always remember that Abram just kind of threw a fit. He just kind of said, really, God? What do you give me? What have you given me since I still don't have a son? And with that, he takes him outside and he said, look now toward heaven. Count the stars if you are able to number them. Look now, look at the stars, count them. Count them if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be be. If you could count them all, you would be able to count your descendants. Look, that's how many descendants you'll have. You're going to have a son, Abram, I promise. You're going to have a son and that son is going to have sons and you're going to have so many descendants, you won't be able to count them. And verse six, the key verse, which is going to come up several more times over the course of our study. And he believed in the Lord. He believed God in this moment. He trusted him. And I want to remind you something. This is so important for us. God has already made this promise to Abram earlier. So you, you can't look at Abram as being this perfect man who never stumbles, who just always has faith that is never, ever questioning, that never, ever wonders, because he's already received this promise. And yet here he is in a moment of like a fit and frustration and anger. And what does he say? He's, you know, he kind of blurts out what he says and then God makes the promise again and Abraham believes him. And what happens because Abraham believes him? It says, he believed in the Lord and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord and the Lord accounted it to him. I'm going to actually put this verse on hold. I'm gonna come back to it in, when we look at chapter 17 because more is gonna come out in that chapter that will kind of give us fodder for this discussion. But what I want you to understand is, is that Paul is going to at least just kind of briefly hearken back to this verse and say, this 
is the proof text that every single one of my kinsmen, all of the Jews need to understand, and this takes us back to the beginning of our study, that we're not saved by the law. We're not saved by keeping the various commandments that are written in the law. We're not saved by adhering to the old priestly Levitical system. We're not saved by any of those things. We're saved in the same way that Abraham was, by believing in God's promise. God made a promise, and we believe in that promise, and because we believe in that promise, we are saved. We are counted righteous because of that. And I'm going to talk extensively about that in, when we look at chapter 17. But let's, let's keep going. Verse 7. Then he said to him, I am the Lord. Remember, the Lord all capitalized, Yahweh. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, that's Abram, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Once again, I love this, guys. Don't, like if you waver at times, if you don't always have perfect faith, if you too sometimes sit there and say, but Lord, how do I know that this promise is for me? How do I know that you are gonna save me? When you waver like that, I'm not saying you should, but what I do want you to understand is you don't need to condemn yourself when that happens. Even Abram does it. Even Abram does it right here, right here, right after it says that it was accounted to him for righteousness. Right after, two verses later, he says, but how will I know? He believed in the Lord. He was counted righteous. Like God looked at him and said, you're righteous. That's good. And then Abram says, but how will I know that I'm going to inherit it? Which is the question we all have. Anytime we, we look to God's promises, anytime that we, we fix a hope in some kind of future blessing from God, The number one question on our hearts and our minds is, but Lord, how do I know? How do I know that that's gonna happen? And I love what God does. It's very weird. And it's not, I think if you just read it, if you were just reading through Genesis, you would not be inclined to like, you would not probably walk away knowing what he's saying. But hopefully we can make sense of it. Look at verse 20. So he, the Lord said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So Abram goes and he gets all these things and he brings them to God. Now you might be wondering, how is God here? You know, and, and so as I think about it, maybe he is in a theophany form. Maybe he is literally standing here in the form, like having taken on the form of a human. And maybe they were really standing in that tent and he really did put his arm around him because in a very anthropomorphic way, that's, if you remember that word, I used it earlier. And like the way that when we use language about the way men, humans, that is, work and function, God says to him, bring me these things. And so Abram goes and he brings all of these things. And then what does it say? It says, he cut them in two, verse 10, down the middle, and he placed each piece opposite the other. Okay, so that is he took those animals, he cut them in half, and then he put each piece opposite of each other, okay? And he lined them up so that it's like, if you could imagine, and it might be kind of a terrible thing to imagine, a bunch of slaughtered animals with half on one side, half on the other, and they're all kind of in a row, okay? But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So he cuts them in half, sets them up, and and maybe it was Abram cutting them up, actually. It doesn't specify. And there it almost sounds like Abram did it, like God, so in which case God wouldn't need to be in a theophany form. Uh, Abram took the animals, cut them in two, spread them out, and then he, there's a waiting game. He's waiting for some reason. Waiting for God to kind of do whatever he's gonna do with this particular uh, thing. And so for a while, Abram's there and the vultures will come. And they come, of course, because they want their scavenger birds. So they're coming to eat from these dead animals. But Abram, every time they come, gets up, Shoes them away. Verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. It's a weird thing. Why horror and great darkness? Why horror and great darkness? And then he, that is God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And will serve them. 
and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Okay, now I wanna pause here. Keep in mind the context. How did this whole conversation start or how did this whole thing start? It started with Abram asking God, how do I know? You have made me a promise that my descendants will be like the stars of the sky. How do I know? And God's answer is kill these animals, split them apart and then wait. And when he does, or he does, and then he falls asleep and then horror and darkness. And then all of a sudden these words, no, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in this land or in a land that is not theirs for 400 years. It's kind of a strange response. But then verse 15, now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now let me explain that. So Abram, who's just wanting certainty about a son and about the promise of massive descendants, he gets a little more to the story. God says, no, certainly, no, certainly what? You will have many descendants. And what will happen to those descendants? They will be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. They're going to be slaves. And of course, if you know the biblical story, you know that that's referencing what will follow the period of time after uh, Joseph and the, the patriarchs move into Egypt and they grow into a nation and they're enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. But afterwards, what's gonna happen? They're gonna be set free and they're gonna return here. And here meaning the land that Abram's living in, the land that God had promised him in 400 years. Let's think back to when we first met Abram. He was living in Ur of the Chaldees there in Mesopotamia in modern day Iraq. God tells him, get up and go to the place I'm gonna show you. What does he do? He immediately gets up and he goes to the place that God shows him, does it. Wanders waiting until God shows him. He finally comes into the land of Canaan. Last week, after, after Lot picked the, the watered plain of the Jordan, God says to Abram, look up, north, south, east, west. Look everywhere. Everything you can see, it will be yours. This whole land is gonna belong to you. And now we get the, a little bit more information. When are you gonna get it, Abram? When will it belong to you? When will it be yours? 400 years after your great-grandson dies. That's when it's going to be yours. 400 years after your great-grandson dies. That's when you get to have this land that I've been promising you. And I want you to think about what that means for Abram. That means in his lifetime, he's never going to receive the promise of God. In his lifetime... At this guy who left everything he knew and wandered and was obedient to the vision, he's not gonna get the promise in this lifetime. That's what's coming to him. But he says, but don't worry, you're gonna live a good long life. You'll be old, you're gonna be homeless and wander around for a long time, but you are gonna live long and you're gonna die in a good ripe old age. But someday your great, 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 great grandkids are gonna come back to this land because the sins of the Amorites are not complete. What that means is until they get bad enough and then I will bring your descendants to judge. That's what Abram hears in the midst of this dream. And then verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. That's weird. Sun goes down all those pieces that have been cut up, all of a sudden, a smoking oven and a burning torch. I don't know, I don't know if it meant a real oven. I, I think fire was like moving around in there. And I think like Moses really didn't have better words to describe what it was. You had fire moving between these cut pieces. And then it says, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant. And remember a covenant, that's an agreement a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girishites, and the Jebusites. All of it's gonna be yours. Now, what set this up? What, like, what's going on here? You have to remember 
the, the question that kicked this whole thing off. How do I know? How do I know I'm going to have a lot of descendants? How do I know that you're going to actually give me this land? And God's response is, cut up these animals. Set them apart. What happens? Fire passes through these animals. What is going on? Here's what's going on. What Abram does here was a practice of the day. When one was to make an oath, a blood oath to somebody, they would cut up animals, split them in half, put them on two sides, and they would pass between the animals. And the implication of this, after passing through the animals, was that you could do to me if I did not fulfill my word to you. So how does God ultimately give Abram, the confidence and the certainty that this is going to be, or that, that he's going to uh, fulfill this promise to him. How does he fulfill his word? By saying, I swear. He's coming through and saying, I swear. And when that flame passes through these split animals, he's actually saying, and if I fail to keep my word, you can kill me in the same way that you could kill any man who walked through. I'm making my covenant with you. Your descendants will be as numerous as the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will inherit this land. I swear, I promise. That's what God is doing in this particular place. And so guys, having said all of this, what do we take away from this text? Two things. I put up one finger, two things. First, that at the end of the day, what do you and I have to receive assurance in terms of the promises of God? We have his word. That's what we have. We have the word of God. And, and when I say the word of God, I, I of course partly mean the Bible in the sense that we have the written word of God and we can read it, we can see his words, and we can remember that the promises that are given to us in this book are ours, right? They are our promises and we can trust in them certainly. But I also want you to remember specifically the promises that he does indeed give in, these word, in, the, in this book. And when I say we have the word of God, what I mean is, is we have the word of God. We have his oath, God himself raising his right hand and swearing because every single time God says that something is true, it is in fact true. It is true the way that he says it's going to be. And so when the scriptures give us a promise, right? Something like, behold, I hold you in my hand and no man plucks you out. That is certain. Be assured of it. When he gives us a promise and says something to us like, what can separate us from the love of God, right? Neither height nor depth nor, you know, any other created thing, a whole list of things. What can separate us from God's love? Nothing. Rest assured, it's certain. It's certain, it's certain. Because he has given his word. When he gives you the promise of eternal life, when he tells you, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and bring you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Know this, he has given his word. And that's what we have to go on. That's the thing that we need to look to. I mean, it's nice to do philosophy and to think about arguments and to do Christian apologetics where you read arguments that are supposed to kind of confirm some of our beliefs in the Bible or in some of the promises of God. I'm not saying those things are useless, but here's the thing. I think we spend way too much time on those kinds of things and not enough time looking at what has God actually promised us and trusting in him and in the promises that he has made us. And, and what I wanna encourage you guys to do is you really gotta get in this habit, in the practice of, of looking up God's promises and memorizing them, knowing them, knowing them backwards and forwards, knowing them so that in those moments when you do waver, in those moments when you like Abraham want to say, but God, how do I know? How do I know that this is what is awaiting me? You have his word. You have his word and you have the promise that he gave in his word. And then you have God backing it up, right? 
Think about what he does when the flame passes through the fires. He says, kill me. Let me be the one who gives his life in, to, to consecrate this covenant and this promise. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus gives his very life in earnestness, in, in, try, in showing his commitment to the promise, fulfilling the promises of God for us. That's the first thing. The second thing I want you guys to consider as we read this text is the nature of this promise. 400 years. 400 years. I guarantee when Abram left his home and was told he was going to go to a land of promise, he was going to go to this wonderful place that God had set aside and picked for him, I guarantee Abram's thought wasn't, oh yay, I can't wait for my great, 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 great grandchildren to finally get a nice place for themselves. What he was thinking was for him now. Now, that's what he was thinking. And that's the thing for each one of us. That's what we all think, right? We want God's promises now, typically. We want God to fulfill his word to us now. We want God to make our lives the way we want them to be now. And he doesn't necessarily work that way, right? That's not necessarily God's mode of operation. God is always working towards eternity. He has an eternal vision, not a temporal one. And we are stuck in this finite world, always looking only two or three feet in front of us, always looking at the next thing and always mindful of the next potential pain that could arise and the next potential blessing that could arise. And we want the pleasure that comes soon, not the pleasure that comes later. That's just the way we are. Today, I took my car to Les Schwab and I feel like Les Schwab tells me that I need to change my tires a lot. I feel like Les Schwab tells me that I need to change my tires more than I need to change my tires. I don't know. I really need to look into it. But I'm definitely one of those guys who, when it comes to automotive stuff, I have the word sucker written on my forehead. <laughs> so I always am like, mm, is this real? And I, tr by the way, I actually trust Les Schwab. So typically, I mean, as far as like these things go, you know, I've been a Les Schwab customer for a long time. Usually I feel like they've done me really well, but there's this, just this one thing and it's my always needing new tires, I feel like. And so today I'm sitting there, I'm reading and I was taking my winter tires off and trying to put my original tires on and the guy walks out and he says, hey sir, I uh, just want to show you something. And he says, that looks like recently, like really recently, he goes, yeah, you bought one, so one, uh, but you need three others to kind of go with it. And I was like, man, because I remember like my tires were just off. So I just looked at them. They look good. I don't know. I'm not an expert. They look really good. <laughs> They're not like messed up. And I'm one of those guys who I definitely drove on really messed up tires before. I've driven on the bald when you see the like wires, the wire mesh. I've driven on that before. These ones look really good. So, so he sits here and he tells me that. I'm like, man, I just, I don't know if this is true. And he goes, now's the time to do it. You just, it, they're on sale. And, and you do it right now. And I just remember sitting there thinking, no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till the summer. I'm going to wait till the summer and I'm going to do it then. Uh, if I have to. I'm going to, of course, look into various things. Here's the reason why I bring that up. I want the pleasure right now. The pleasure of not having to pay 400 plus dollars. I'll pay the 400 plus dollars a little bit later down the road because I want the good stuff now and I want the bad stuff later. That's the way it goes. And of course, hopefully, prayerfully, I'm not going to end up popping one of these tires on the side of the road and having to get, having to change my tire there and, you know, having to feel like an idiot as I walk, as I drive into Les Schwab with that donut and have that guy sit there and go, yeah, just what I thought. Because I, I put things off. I always put things off. I always try to do things later down the road that are going to be costly and painful. And I always want to do, and I always want to take or do the things that are going to bring me pleasure and joy here and now. And this is, I mean, obviously it's like parenting 101. You know, when you're raising children and you're trying to teach them how to live life, like you want to teach them defer, defer pleasure. 
Don't seek the immediate pleasure all the time because that's going to hurt you. And I will say that the more you can instill that in your kids, the better off they're gonna be in life because real happiness is almost always in that deferred pleasure mode. But what we're seeing here is God is reminding us that all of it, everything that really matters is way down the road. And because of that, we have to really develop an eye. We have to develop an ability to see the world differently from the way the rest of the world sees it. Because the rest of the world always sees it in the terms of the here and now. And that's largely because that's all they think they've got. The here and now. We've got this life and that's it. And when this life is over, we die. So eat drink and be merry. And what they want is they want all the, all the good things now. They want, they want pleasure now. They want justice now. They want peace now. They want comfort and satisfaction now. And their uh, belief is that in the long run down the road, it's not going to be there. And what the Lord is saying is, look, none of those things really happen now. You might have momentary, momentary fleeting moments of pleasure, you might happen to experience some justice in the world, but just so you know, most of it's going to be injustice or a lot of it's going to be injustice anyway. You might feel like you are rooted and like you actually have a home that will last for a while, but it won't. You might feel like you're making a legacy for yourself and a name for yourself, but you're not. All of the things that feel like you're being rooted and like it's lasting and like it matters here and now isn't. What really matters is coming way down the road. What really matters is coming way down the road. Let's go back to the book of Hebrews, if, we will, if you will, with me. Would you turn with me to chapter 11? Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 13. Hebrews 11 is a, a well-known passage. It teaches on the great men and women who've gone before us in the faith. The great men and women of faith. And it talks about what they did by faith. And you better believe Abraham is included in this particular chapter. But what I want you to look at is this little interlude in the middle of the chapter in verse 13, speaking of these people like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, like Moses that he's been talking about. This is what he says. These all, all these people died in faith, not having received the promises. That's the key thing. They died without having received the promises. Abraham is gonna die and he's still gonna be homeless and he's still gonna be wandering and he's still not going to be a nation of people. He will die before he sees all of those promises ultimately fulfilled. And Abram's not the last one who's going to live his life like that. Moses, oh, Moses, such a tragic story. As you guys all know, he failed down the stretch. He messed up. And because he did, God told him, you're not going to enter the promised land. You don't get to go into the homeland, the land of promise that God had, had sworn that he would give Abram. And you know what? Abram, all he wants is a son. All Moses wanted was to go in the promised land. So sad at the end of his life, he goes, Lord, please, please let me go in. Please, even but for a moment. And God says, don't speak to me about it again. You're not going in. You're not going in. And God's last gift to Moses was he took him up on the mountain so he could see it one time before he died. It was his final gift. And then Moses dies. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What he's saying is we need to be like these guys. We need to recognize that the promises of God are not for the immediate here and now. They're afar off, but we need to see them. We need to confess them. And in doing so, what are we saying about ourselves? That we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. That is, that we're wanderers, just like Abraham. You and I, we don't have a home. Boise, Idaho is not our home. As much as I want to make it that, it's not. And I, God's call, I need to be yielded to God's call. And if God should call me to leave this place and go somewhere else, I need to be yielded to do that. And someday, barring, uh, like, should, should the Lord tarry and not return in my lifetime, God will call me out of this place. He will, and I will have to leave it. 
undeniably and unquestionably, because I'll have to die. And so what is he saying? These guys, they saw the promises were far off 400 years down the road, but they embraced them. And they said, it's all okay. I'm a stranger in this land. Verse 14, those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. They seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, this is just dripping with Abraham, uh, 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 Abraham, uh, oh shoot, I'm losing the word, uh, visual stuff, <laughs> like imagery, Abraham, Abrahamic imagery. Uh, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had an opportunity to return. If Abraham had ever thought, dude, what am I doing here? I should go back to Babylon. I should go back home. I should go back to Ur, back to place that I understand. If he'd ever stopped, he could have. He could have gone back, but he didn't because he saw that he had a different country, a country that was awaiting him way down the road. Can, uh, carry on, verse 16. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. They desire a better, a heavenly country. He's saying that people of faith need to have a different kind of way of looking at the world. We see the world through faith. And, and the idea is that we see through the institutions of this world into the promises of God. I'm not a citizen of Boise, Idaho. I'm not a citizen of the United States of America. I am a citizen of a heavenly country and I'm sojourning in this land and doesn't mean that I need to dislike it. it does, I mean, I can love it. I can love it. I can love the, the benefits that I have being a stranger and a pilgrim in this land and the rewards and blessings. But at the end of the day, it's not my home. I have another homeland and that homeland is a heavenly homeland and I need to be living with my eyes fixed on that future heavenly homeland. And look at what happened, for he has prepared a city for them. Love that verse. God is not ashamed to be called their God. If there's anything that I would, have, I would love, it would be to hear those words that Jesus says are coming to, to so many, right? Well done, my good and faithful servant. To hear God say, you did well. You did well. I'm not ashamed of you. Be a glorious thing. When you can see with those eyes, he's not ashamed to call you God and he has prepared a city for you. And that's the verse I quoted earlier when Jesus was getting ready, kind of giving his final teachings to his disciples and told them that he was leaving. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I do go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back again so that I can take you to myself that wherever I am, there you might be also. That's what Abraham's life is supposed to be an image of for each one of us. We see this wanderer in this land and we see how he lives with his eyes fixed on a home that he doesn't see and that he never will see in his lifetime. And yet he keeps walking that path and he keeps being obedient to God and he keeps embracing the vision of this homeland that will come long after he's gone. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. Amen? Amen. Um, we do have a few minutes if you guys have any questions for me before we take communion. Are there any questions tonight? Yeah. Yes, okay, so the, yeah, so, um, the land that is promised according to the promise is from the Euphrates River all the way down to what they call the River of Egypt. Whether or not that's the Nile, it's not super clear. That's like an obvious uh, answer. But yeah, that's the land that is promised. So the question is, is did they inhabit all of that land? If it goes all the way to the Nile, then no, they haven't. However, um, Solomon's kingdom at its height they think does stretch all the way from the Euphrates into what is the Sinai Peninsula. And certainly a lot of commentaries, uh, commentaries and uh, like uh, uh, Bible teachers have said that, that, that that promise ultimately was fulfilled when Solomon became king. Others say that it's supposed to go even further and that that is reserved instead for a future millennial reign when Christ will rule literally. Um, in the kingdom.
I couldn't hear you. Could you? Uh, so the question is, is, do the stripes on the flag of Israel represent the bodies of, I don't uh, represent those bodies of water mentioned in the promise. I don't know. I'm trying to picture the flag of Israel and all I can remember is the star of David. I'm not picturing the stripes, but I wouldn't know what they're referencing anyway. Um, uh, you know, I, you could uh, probably look that up, I would imagine, but I'm not certain. That would be interesting if they did. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, is if the Hebrew tradition did not have vowels, how did they have the word AI, which is definitely just two vowels? And I have no idea because I don't know Hebrew. Does anybody know Hebrew who can answer that? My friend Andrew Stapira, who may watch this at some point, when he watches, I don't know how many of you guys know Andrew, when he watches uh, occasionally uh, at home or later, uh, he'll text me because Andrew does know Hebrew and he will often fill me in on, on some of these things. So I will try to ask Andrew next time I talk to him or Andrew, if you watch this, shoot me a text and let me know. Um, but I'm not really certain how, yeah, how they would pronounce AI. That is a really good question. Um, so... <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Casey. Oh, that's a good question. So the question was um, with Christ Christophanes in the Old Testament, that is when you see an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, before he was born, is he in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is he in the body that he actually walked on this earth when he was, uh, when he manifest as Jesus? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, but I've always thought no. I've always thought that, that he took on whatever form seemed appropriate at the time rather than than showing you know the the body that he would in fact have it it's really important i will use this as kind of a launching point guys that jesus god as man in the person of christ you have to understand that in jesus there's the mystery god jesus is fully god and yet fully man born of a woman raised from childhood and fully man like we are when you see a christophany that's not fully man. That's like, like you driving a car, right? It's like God getting in a body and controlling it, so to speak. Would he make it look like Jesus? That is Jesus as he, as he was to come, maybe, but I, I, I never thought that. I always thought that he took whatever form seemed appropriate to the moment. And some of the theophanies, whether it's like Christophany, meaning like the second person of the Trinity, embodied or not, I don't know. But general theophanies in the Bible often don't even take a humanoid form. Like the burning bush is a theophany, right? And that's a flame of fire. So when I think back to some of the, some of the, the theophany forms, you know, male forms, like for instance, uh, oh, Joshua meeting the captain of the Lord's army. A lot of people think that that's a theophany or Jacob meeting the angel that he wrestles. A lot of people think that's a theophany. We're not always certain with all of these. Um, I always just assume that the form that is taken is whatever is appropriate to that moment. But it could be, it could be. I just hadn't, I never really thought that it was. Yes. Yes, so, so I did mention, of course, the torch in the burning oven that came before was also like a theophany, yep. Any other, we have time for one more really quickly if there's any more questions. Yeah. Oh, are you talking about where, so where James says and so, uh, we're saved by works and not by faith alone, that one? Okay, I could never answer that in three minutes. Um, 
So, yeah, so for those of you watching at home, the question was basically how to, and I don't remember the exact verse, which one you said James 2, 24, uh, specifically James, I'll read it just so we know, uh, James, yeah, 2, 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. That's a tough one. And yeah, with five minutes left, I just, there's no way I'd be able to do that justice. Um, and I'm trying to think of if there would be a way for me to address it. Um, when I talk about, I was planning on talking in Genesis 17 about being saved by grace through faith. And I was going to spend a lot of time talking about that. I will try when I deal with that to address James. But if not, I'll have to probably set aside specific time to address it or... I could shoot you an email or something, um, although I'm slow on getting back to emails. As anybody who sent me an email knows, if any of you guys have done that. So that's, that takes a little bit more time. But I... No, then let's go ahead and uh, take communion. I think the most striking image in the Melchizedek story is that he comes out with bread and wine. I mean, there's no question that the author of Hebrews, when he's, when he's referencing Melchizedek as a Christophany, that he's specifically thinking of the bread and the wine. And, and so, guys, as, as we come together here to partake of the bread and the cup, I want you to think about just how old this practice is just how long people have been doing this in communion with each other and in worship and sacrifice to God. It stretches back not just the 2,000 years of church history, but it goes back even further, all the way back to Abraham, who partook of bread and wine with Melchizedek, although no doubt not fully understanding what it was. And so with that Remind, rem, just remember that when we do take the bread, we are remembering the broken body of Jesus. That body which was nail pierced, hanged on a cross, was stabbed in the side, which of course had been beaten and had the crown of thorns placed on it, and of course which died. And when we drink the cup, we remember the blood that was spilled. And in his death and in the spilling of his blood, we receive the blessing of the forgiveness of sin and the, hopeness of, the hope of new life and of resurrection of the dead. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this bread. We thank you for this cup. We thank you more importantly for what they represent. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus who came, who offered up his body, who spilled his blood so that we might live. He died that we might live. And Father, we see in his death, we see you holding fast to your word. We see you holding fast to the promise of salvation for each one of us. And we do, Lord, just ask, as we do partake of these elements, that you would transfig uh, transfigure or fix our minds on Jesus, on what he did. Help us to remember him. And then also, as Paul says, help us to declare it to a lost and dying world. We love you and we praise you and we remember these things as we take this bread. And as we drink this cup. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. God bless you guys.
Have a great rest of the week, especially if you're on spring break. And I will see you guys next week. Actually, not on spring break since... <laughs>